everyone. Welcome to our webinar. We will give it just a few minutes so that everyone can come in. Hi everyone, thank you for joining. Give it just one more minute for our attendees to trickle in and we will get started. Okay, with that, I think we are ready to begin. Um, welcome everyone, thank you for joining. Um, this is a webinar on Vera's plastic program and plastic credits, and specifically we're speaking to some of those insights that might be relevant to financial institutions um, interested in the plastic program or plastic credits. Um, Today, it will be me, Kristen Linscott, and manager on the Plastics Policy and Markets team at Vera, joined by my colleague, Vigil Yu, a senior program officer on our team. We'll be walking you through a presentation and we'll be joined by a few speakers as well. So on the next slide, we'll have Rohan Bhargav from World Bank, Steve Hardman from Plastic Collective, and Sonia Batik from City, who will be speaking um, during various points in the presentation. On the next slide, we have our agenda. So we'll start out, and Vera will provide an introduction of the plastic program and plastic credits, and then we'll hear from the World Bank, um, sharing some of the insights they have from their recently issued report, Unlocking Finance to Combat the Plastic Crisis. We'll speak a bit more about the potential for the plastic program to mobilize finance with Vera's plastic program. And then we'll spend a bit of time um, taking a, a bit of a deep dive into the plastic waste reduction linked bond. And that's where we'll have City and Plastic Collective to provide some perspectives. And we will wrap up sharing some of the market opportunities for plastic credits and we'll do Q&A with any time remaining. Um, and, and on that last point about Q&A, you should see the Q&A functionality in the Zoom um, uh, panel. So if there are any questions that you want to ask, feel free to submit those. We'll be monitoring them throughout the session and hopefully we'll have a bit of time to get to them at the end. Um, but with that, I think we're going to jump right into the presentation today, and I am going to pass it over to my colleague, Vigil, to get us started. Great. Thanks, Kirsten. Hi, everyone. Very, very much uh, welcome to our webinar. I will get us uh, started. So just a quick introduction of Vera. We are a nonprofit uh, that's founded in 2007 in Washington, D.C., and now we have a staff all over the world. Vera is the world's leading standard setter for climate action and sustainable development. We develop and manage a range of standards which are used widely by the private sector, governments, and civil society to meet their climate and development goals. We currently have more than 2,000 projects worldwide in 95 different countries. And uh, for example, the Verified Carbon Standard is the world's leading voluntary carbon market program. And uh, the Plastic Waste Reduction Standard is our newest program and this topic of today's webinar. Before jumping to our program, I just want to take one step back and share a few statistics to provide a few different aspects of the plastic pollution problem. We all know uh, the challenge from the environmental aspect. Uh, we know the plastic waste being generated is projected to triple by 2060 compared to the 2019 level, and 40 million tons of plastic leaks into our ocean every year. And current government and industry commitments will only lead to a 7% reduction in this leakage by the year 2040. However, beyond being an environmental challenge, it's also a social and equity problem. There are more than 20 million informal waste workers around the world. They are the backbone of waste management in many countries 
However, they are also often subjected to dangerous and unsafe working conditions. To exacerbate this inequality issue, um, the vulnerable geographies and uh, communities are disproportionately affected by plastic pollution, as 86% of plastic leakage occurs in developing countries. However, about 90% of global investment in the plastic circularity has gone to the global north. There is a huge financial gap in dealing with plastic pollution, as an uh, estimated one trillion uh, US dollar investment in the private sector is needed annually before 2025 to 2040 to really significantly reduce mismanaged plastic volume. However, in the past few years, only 32 billion US dollar are being invested into plastic circularity annually. To further drive this point home, we know plastic pollution is very costly. To really implement measures to eliminate mismanaged plastic waste by 2040 will cost about 0.5% uh, of global GDP. However, as the total lifetime cost of one kilo of plastic waste is eight to 10 times higher for low income countries compared to high income countries, uh, they are uh, it's estimated that in OECD countries, the cost will be roughly 0.4% of their GDP, however, 1.5% in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this further underscores the need for enhanced international support for these nations. And there is a need for both voluntary and regulatory levers to fully tackle the problem. As mentioned, the current commitments from governments and industries only accounts for 7% reduction in plastic leakage compared to the business as usual scenario. However, it is not technology uh, that, we need, that we lack. We have the necessary solutions. However, what we do not yet have is adequate regulatory frameworks, business models, and financing mechanisms. So scaling up both voluntary and governmental actions will be key to fully support effective um, plastic waste management. And so uh, here comes our uh, Vera's plastic program. Um, it's an uh, investment mechanism to catalyze effective local plastic waste management, and it's really part of the solution to the above mentioned challenges. Here are the key components of Vera's plastic program. Uh, the plastic standard and the supporting methodologies provide the underlying framework of our program. It is a basis for measuring and monitoring plastic waste management projects impact, and also to check if the operation of a project is in alignment with the mandatory environmental and social safeguards. And project compliant with our plastic standard are and are audited by third parties can be issued plastic credits. And plastic credits are uh, equals to one ton of additional plastic waste that's collected from nature and or recycled. As you can see, we have two different types of plastic credit. Uh, the first one is the plastic waste collection credits, and they are aimed to support activities that collect plastic waste and make sure that they don't leak back into nature. And they are handled in local appropriate and destinations. And this is particularly relevant for the materials that are currently very difficult to recycle or do not get recycled at all. And in general, there is a lack of incentive for this kind of plastics collection and safe management. And plastic waste recycling credits aim to help scale recycling facilities and generate recycled feedstock that can go back to the economy for the second life and replace virgin plastic usage. And our program currently uh, includes all seven types of plastics plus composite materials that contain plastics. And it could encompass a range of different activities. A couple of examples here are recovery of ocean plastics, collections through waste figures, uh, infrastructure development, and uh, the expansion or establishment of mechanical and chemical recycling facilities. Here's the overview of the overall uh, process of how our plastic program work. And uh, we can start from the yellow section on top. So these are these individual projects around the world that are doing plastic collection or recycling. And let's assume they, comply, they are compliant with various plastic standards. The third party audits will be needed for the projects to prove their compliance. They will also go through a public comment period so concerns can be raised from the public. 
And once all that's done, uh, Vera as a standard setter will review the project and see, and the file checks out, the project will be issued plastic credits. These credits will be displayed on our registry, which is publicly available, and people can easily see where the project is located and what kind of activities are being carried out and what type of plastics are being recycled or collected. And once the credit are, have been issued, then business and other organizations can purchase them to fulfill their, their targets. And ultimately, funding through plastic credit can go back to these projects on the ground. Uh, here are some key components to really enable our standard to certify the most impactful projects. And first of all, the project, the standard has global applicability. So projects from all over the world can use it and issue plastic credits if they comply. And another essential comp uh, component for the program is additionality, which means projects need to demonstrate that their activity has impact above an estab established baseline scenario, and only additional impact can be certified. The standard also has a robust development and government process governance process. The program was developed through a multi-stakeholder approach and has undergone public consultation and technical reviews. It also undergoes periodic updates that is informed by policy, markets, and technological developments. The standard enables third-party audits um, that ensures integrity. So all the project needs to go through the third-party verification process to ensure that they have provided sufficient evidence to show that they meet our requirements. Last but not least, the standard has incorporated social safeguards that require project components to, to confirm that there is no negative impacts on the natural environment, local community, or the informal waste sector as a result of the project activity. Here is the overview of our project so far. Since the program has been launched in 2021, uh, we have seen uh, projects from six different continents, and currently we have a total of 18 projects registered, and uh, 50 projects are still in the pipeline, and we are expecting to see more projects coming into our registry. So with that is a brief view of our program, and I will introduce our next speaker, Rohan Bargav from the World Bank. He, Rohan is an environmental specialist based in Washington, D.C., he supports the World Bank Environment Department's portfolio in Southeast Asia and the Pacific on climate change, carbon pricing, plastics, and the environmental management. Rohan joined the World Bank in 2018 and has a master's degree in environmental policy from Utrecht University. He will now share some insights from the World Bank's latest report. Yes, thank you, um, Next slide, please. Yes, while we wait, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here, and thank you, Vera, for inviting uh, the World Bank to present. Um, so just some background. As Rachel mentioned, we uh, published a report on plastic credits uh, in June of this year. Um, the report is called Unlocking Financing to Combat the Plastics Crisis, Opportunities, Risk, and Recommendations for Plastic Credits. Uh, the report covers uh, three main areas. One is a bit of an overview of what um, plastic credits are, so how they work, um, what the purpose is, et cetera. Uh, the second part is a little bit of a market landscape um, on what the plastic credits um, market looks like at the moment, um, since it is quite early on. Um, it's quite an interesting landscape analysis. Um, and the third part is just recommendations on ensuring on how to ensure plastic credits are used effectively um, and responsibly. Um, so uh, I'll cover a little bit of each of those elements in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is uh, a little bit similar to what I think Mitchell just presented, but I'll cover a little bit uh, broader scope on how plastic credits work in terms of the actual um, plastic credit cycle. Uh, so there's three main stages. Uh, the first is uh, in gold. So it's the pollution reduction project implementation. Uh, this is what is you know actually happening on the ground. And this is run by project owners. So the project owners are the ones um, doing whatever on the ground reduction activities there are. Uh, in parallel is this stage two, which is the certification process. 
Um, and so that process is set by standard setters like Vera. Um, each of these uh, processes are a little bit different depending on the standard setter, um, but generally um, they all follow the same steps. Uh, they have project registration, um, verification and monitoring of the actual project on the ground, uh, and then credit issuance. Um, and most standards also require audits by uh, validation and verification bodies. Um, so uh, once a project goes through this process, uh, credit can be issued. Uh, and that brings us to the third step in green, which is the uh, credit sale and retirement. Uh, so um, buyers of plastic credits uh, either buy it for compliance purposes um, or on a voluntary basis. Um, and so uh, sellers will either um, sell it directly to a final buyer um, or through brokers and traders. Um, and obviously the, the final buyer is the one that can make the uh, associated environmental claims with the credits. Um, and then throughout this process, there's often um, third-party advisory service providers who are also um, supporting, uh, particularly because uh, a lot of the methodologies are quite complicated um, and require a lot of uh, technical um, knowledge and know-how. So um, it's often useful to involve um, advisory providers as well. Um, next slide, please. So in the report, um, we identified three main categories of standard programs. Uh, I think most programs have started in the past uh, four years or less. So there's a lot of diversity in what's out there. They vary in definitions, um, what's eligible, um, what their methodologies look like, et cetera. And so to kind of help provide a, a clearer overview of what uh, things look like at the moment, um, we've um, broken it down into these three categories. I'll quickly run through each of these, but there's a lot more information in the report um, if you want to learn more. Uh, so the first category is fully independent credit standard programs. These are um, programs that have public standards and methods. Um, they have third-party verification that's required. Um, their standards, these standards are actually only really focused on that second stage that I mentioned in the last slide. So they're not involved in project development um, or directly in credit sales. Um, and their registries are um, quite detailed and available to the public. Um, so there's three um, standards that we've identified in the report that fall under this category one. Um, they're a bit of a mouthful, full, but I'll go through them quickly. So there's Zero Plastic Oceans, Ocean Bound Plastic Certification Program, OPP. Um, there's VERA's uh, Plastic Waste Reduction Standard, PWRS. Um, and then there's Green Blue's Recycled Material Standard, RMS. Uh, so at the moment, those are the three um, that we put in category one. Uh, moving to category two, um, these are uh, similar to category one, uh, but with one main difference. Um, these programs often are affiliated with um, other parts of the value chain. So they might be involved in um, sales assistance to the project owners um, or might provide implementation support to projects. Um, so they're um, you know, more involved in the actual project cycle than category one programs. Um, they often have uh, varying levels of data transparency as well. Um, so there's two uh, programs that we put in um, category two. Uh, the first is PCX Solutions Plastic Pollution Reduction Standard, PPRS. Uh, and the second is BV Rio's Circular uh, Credits Mechanism, or CCM. Um, so then I'll move on to the third category, which kind of an umbrella for um, all the other standards. Um, so there's quite a lot of variety in these, but generally um, we found that these category, uh, these standards are um, have you know methodologies that are not always public. They're often um, involved throughout the project cycle and are self-issuing credits um, without a third-party um, auditor. Um, and they have limited data available um, publicly, so they might not have a um, public database um, of projects and uh, credits. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's overview of the three categories we have. Uh, next slide, please. So moving on to that uh, next part of the report on what actually the market looks like. Um, and I'll caveat that the report goes up to December, 2023. Uh, so it's a little bit um, um, stale data, but this is uh, the latest that we had. And it only covers category one and two projects. As I mentioned, category three, the data is not always um, publicly available. Uh, so if you look at the map on the left, um, we've listed out uh, the distribution of registered and listed projects um, across the regions and standards. Um, so South Asia, um, East Asia, and Latin America are the you know, regions most active at the moment um, with registered projects. Uh, and then on the right, you can kind of see that breakdown by 
um, the different programs. So um, I won't go into too much detail, but you can see um, the, the breakdown by each of the category one, category two programs and um, where they're most focused. Um, and so, yeah, just very quickly, Vera, PCX, and BB Rio are the ones that have the highest number of registered projects. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit more on the trends at the moment. Um, so as of December 23, uh, we found that there were 75,000 plastic credits uh, issued or verified um, with the majority under uh, category two programs. So if you look at the chart on the top right, um, you can see CCM in Latin America and Caribbean and PPRS in East Asia and Pacific are the ones that um, have the largest number of projects with issued credit. Um, and then uh, if you look at the bottom right, we also looked at um, kind of the trends year over year on how many uh, credits have been issued or verified, um, and it's been gradually growing. Um, in 2023, there were just over 25,000 plastic credits issued or verified. Um, and the information on pricing is still, um, you know, limited, but what we found is that there's um, quite a large um, variance among prices across these um, programs and projects. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so one of the main focuses of the report was uh, how to use plastic credits in EPR schemes and um, what the um, current situation is. Uh, so there's a couple of countries that have uh, introduced plastic crediting into EPR. Um, those include India, the Philippines, Poland, and the UK. Uh, the way this works is obligated uh, parties under the EPR scheme um, can purchase plastic credits uh, to meet part of their obligations. And then the financing from those purchases can directly benefit the uh, plastic production project on the ground. Um, there's a lot of recommendations on best practices in the reports, um, but I think the key message we have is that uh, plastic crediting certainly does not displace the need um, for EPR schemes and more broadly other long-term effort and commitments. Um, so it's uh, a useful tool, um, but not necessarily a, a, you know, a golden solution. Um, so finally, just, just a little bit on um, what the EPR market looks like. So as I mentioned, the PPRS um, standard is quite active in East Asia. And um, what we found in 2023 is 30% of their retired credits were used um, for um, obligations under the Philippines EPR scheme, which only just started in 2022. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the report identified a few different benefits and risks um, on benefits. Obviously, uh, it's uh, plastic credits um, are a useful alternative um, financing mechanism to incentivize uh, plastic reduction activities, and they help make projects more economical and viable. Um, benefit two, uh, they can help uh, place a price on uh, plastics, so they um, you know, kind of help price in the externality. Uh, benefit three, they uh, provide a framework for transparent and traceable result-based accounting. Um, so even projects that are not necessarily uh, seeking plastic credits can still use the methodologies to track their impact. Uh, and benefit four, um, they can improve social and uh, environmental conditions. A lot of standards um, have uh, quite a strong focus on environmental and sa uh, social safeguards um, and ensuring that the benefits are accrued by um, particularly marginalized groups in the waste management sector. Uh, so on risk, um, we found that programs, um, as you might have noted from one of my earlier slides, um, vary in quality and robustness. Um, so there's a need for common definitions and alignment on key principles um, so that the market is a little bit more um, certain um, and reliable. Uh, risk two, the uh, risk of double accounting is very real. Um, and I think many, many people know of you know, problems with that in carbon credits. Uh, so I'm um, ensuring that double accounting is uh, taken seriously um, and monitored closely. Uh, risk three, um, there's currently uncertain demand and there's a risk of low prices that could hinder project uptake in the long-term future of the market. Uh, risk four, um, greenwashing. Um, so obviously the use of plastic credits, um, if not done responsibly, could lead to um, greenwashing by organizations and corporations uh, involved in the sector. Um, risk five, uh, the methodologies involved are usually quite uh, technically complex and require a lot of work. Uh, so there's a risk that projects, particularly at the small scale, might not be able to access uh, plastic crediting just because of how um, demanding the methodologies are. Uh, and then risk six, uh, currently at the moment, uh, all the methodologies and standards that we looked at only focus on uh, downstream solutions. 
which means uh, upstream solutions, which are uh, desperately needed across the board, might be overshadowed um, if we um, heavily rely on plastic credits um, to finance um, projects. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, we had five recommendations coming out from the reports. Um, recommendation one is strengthening the governance system of plastic crediting. Um, so this could include the uh, potential creation of a neutral governance body. Um, recommendation two is helping address market dynamics and uncertainties. Um, so one of the ideas that was proposed is a dedicated fund or pre-purchasing facility, which could um, be established to send a positive signal uh, and gives uh, a little bit more confidence about the demand and pricing in the market. Um, recommendation three is guidelines for EPR and plastic crediting. So as I mentioned, uh, there's a couple of countries that are doing it now, but still quite early on. Um, and there's a lot of interest in um, this kind of combination of plastic credits and EPR schemes. Uh, so developing guidelines would be quite useful um, at this stage. Uh, recommendation four, uh, definitely providing technical assistance um, for early stage and informal projects. Uh, these are the projects that might not have the capacity or the know-how to um, access plastic credits at the moment, but are definitely uh, ones that should be targeted by plastic credits. Um, and then recommendation five is uh, piloting upstream solutions. So as I mentioned, all the methodologies focus on downstream solutions, um, but there's certainly a need for more upstream um, focus among these credits. Um, next slide. Uh, so just to close, uh, key findings from the reports. Uh, there is, yeah, as I mentioned, there's good potential for um, plastic credits to be a, a, a new source of results-based financing. Um, they helped enhance uh, monitoring um, and reporting. They inject accountability um, and they drive more funding. Um, they provide a means to measure and verify plastic production results, and that links to the plastic bond that uh, will be discussed um, later today. Um, yeah, uh, there's, you know, most of the standards, I think, started in 2020 or afterwards, so there's still, you know, a strong need for governance, high integrity, and robust methodologies, um, so that way there's uh, confidence in the standards. Um, overall, uh, we say that uh, plastic crediting is not a panacea, but uh, neither uh, poison. So, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages. I think because it's so early on, it's still to be seen how effective they can be. But um, it's absolutely critical that um, the strong governance um, of all the standards is promoted. Um, and finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, plastic credits are just one instrument in a very large toolkit of um, innovative finance solutions and more broadly policies. Um, they should not uh, displace any other efforts and commitments. Um, and there's obviously much bigger um, solutions that should be promoted above these um, on the policy end. Uh, so I think with that, I'll close um, and back to you, Vigil and Kristen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rohan. I mean, I think it's incredibly helpful that you're able to run through that overview of the report. And for any attendees that are interested, and looking at it further, it will be linked in the slide deck that's shared, or you can access it online today. Um, but I think having just this information at this stage in the plastic credit market can provide the basis of what the landscape looks like, who are the players, is just extremely helpful as people are getting familiar with it. Um, and kind of carrying off of that, I'm going to speak a little bit more about that the innovative finance angle and how plastic credits and specifically those issued with Vera's plastic program can provide this tool for mobilizing the finance that's needed. So on the next slide, we just really want to highlight that, you know, as, as Visual said, there's intensifying pressure to find as many solutions as possible to to fill those finance gaps and address the, you know, severe plastic leakage problem. And that's where solutions like plastic credits come in. People realize that, you know, even the effective implementation of global, global and national policies are really going to hinge on the availability of adequate, predictable, accessible, and sustainable finance, which is why there is such an urgent need to align financial flows from all possible sources. And that's where, um, you know, Vera's program stands to serve as, as one of those sources. So on the 
the next slide, we just have this nice graphic that also highlights the advantage of a tool like plastic credits um, and its versatility to work with other mechanisms or instruments like EPR or outcomes-based bonds, policy-based loans or multilateral funds and more. And through these vehicles, it can help to mobilize finance from a variety of private and public sources. And on the next slide, we've kind of highlighted some of the distinct advantages of using a results-based mechanism like plastic credits for financing these types of activities. Um, you know, firstly, just the plastic program by nature, it, it's underpinned by a plastic standard and two supporting methodologies, which helps to standardize the impact assessment of investments that are made into plastic waste management, giving a global recognized framework um, for monitoring and measuring and then assuring those outcomes as well which then enables people to know that the funding is being directed to high integrity projects that are additional third party audited and ad adhere to those environmental and social safeguards that people have alluded to throughout the presentations. We know that for investors, this certification can help simplify some of the investment due, due diligence and ensure that the funds are you know, truly being directed to additional and verifiable projects. And by this way, just the nature of, of uh, how this plastic credits can be used can also help unlock finding, funding for regions that might not always have access to traditional means of financing. And just going on to the next slide, I feel like we can't talk <laughs> about plastic or finance without bringing in the ongoing global plastic treaty negotiations. We know that this is, especially by the negotiators, something that people are looking at closely. Um, there is an expert group that worked intercessionally between INC4 and INC5 to specifically work on analyzing all the potential sources and means that could be mobilized to implement the plastic treaty. Um, and in looking at the innovative finance sources, they acknowledged a few different things, and that included plastic credits, um, as well as the plastic bond, as ways where public and private sector finance can be, you know, activated to address plastic pollution. Um, and, and mentioning the plastic bond gives me a good segue into the next piece, um, the plastic waste Redu reduction linked bond that was issued in January by the World Bank made news and for good reason. I think it's an extremely innovative approach to blended finance mechanisms. And today we're really lucky to be joined by two organizations who were deeply involved in the bond. Um, that being Sonia and Steve, who will be able to share a little bit more from their perspectives. But first, I'll introduce them so you have some background on who they are. Um, Sonia joined City in September of 2021 as the global head of carbon offsets trading, bringing with her 20 years of trading experience across, across equities and commodities derivatives within banks and trading houses. Um, in fact, prior to joining City, she was at shell for close to six years where she initiated the carbon offsets business. Um, she holds a, a master's in financial markets, commodities, and risk management, and has a wealth of experience in this area. And Steve is, Steve Hardman is the CEO of a social enterprise called Plastic Collective. Plastic Collective develops plastic recycling projects around the world, which are often community-based and operated by um, remote, vulnerable, or indigenous communities, and Plastic Collective is a leader in providing innovative finance solutions for plastic waste collection and recycling projects in the most challenging markets. So having that context, I'm going to, we're going to kind of just talk to them in more of a casual um, format. So I want to start by asking Steve to share a little bit more about maybe kind of the context for 
the bond and the solution it provided. I know a lot of times when we're talking about finance, there's a lot of challenges just due to the nature of plastic waste collection or recycling. So could you speak a little bit more to the nature you were finding and kind of why a need for a blended finance solution like this bond came about? Oh, you are muted. Thank there you, go. you are now not muted. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Kristen, for that. And um, nice to meet everyone. And uh, thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, yeah, so the, the plastic waste reduction bond was something that was um, incubated over quite a long time. Um, won't kill, bore you with the, the full story, but Sonia and I um, had been working on this for a good number of years, trying to work out how we could leverage um, plastic credit mechanisms to capitalise um, projects in remote and vulnerable communities around the world. And and so it took a fair while for it to come together. Uh, we eventually got World Bank involved uh, and then it accelerated ahead. So, you know, to just very quickly summarize what the plastic waste reduction bond was, it was a $100 million bond, um, which was invested by uh, institu private institutional investors from around the world. Um, 14 million of those $100 million went to two projects, one in Ghana, one in um, Surabaya. Uh, and so those two projects are now fully funded um, to, to address plastic waste and catalyze circularity in those, those territories. And so I'll just give you a little bit of background of uh, why and how uh, that bond worked and, um, and really what the, the problem was we were trying to solve. So if you look at the plastic problem, I mean, it really is a global problem, but it's its greatest um, negative impact is felt in the global south uh, and the emerging nations, you know, therein. And, and this is where the lack of waste management services see large volumes of plastic leak directly into nature. And so, so this leakage of plastic into nature is, is a burden which is not seen in developed nations because you know they have municipal waste management services which usually successfully collect most plastic waste. Um, and so at, at the same time in these emerging nations that have the greatest burden of the plastic problem, they also have the least access to funding to build the necessary collection and recycling capacity. You know, and like I say, this, this is a distinctly different problem from what developing nations have because they can access finance relatively uh, you know, more, more straightforward. So, so in essence, emerging nations have a much bigger problem to solve when it comes to plastic waste um, and they have the least access to funding. So that's it really compounds the problem. So this is really where the, the biggest challenge in the plastic problem lays, essentially in the, the southern hemisphere and with emerging nations. And if, if you look at the global recycling capacity, so the average global recycling capacity at the moment, somewhere around 9%, um, you know, for us to get to 100% uh, where we have a circular world, the recycling ex recycling capacity and collection capacity expansion, which is required, it is just absolutely an extraordinary number. Um, it's estimated that we need $5.4 trillion of funding by 2040 to make the world circular. And so if you just look at the the financing um, that we provided or we coordinated with Citibank and World Bank to the two projects from the first plastic waste reduction bond, which was $14 million. If we were to do similar financing events to that over the next 16 years, uh, we would need to do around 400,000 similar financing events in 16 years. Uh, which would it was equivalent of about a hundred every single day for the next sixteen years. So the amount of money is absolutely colossal that needs to make the world that is needed to make the world circular. And regrettably, the majority of that money is needed in the southern hemisphere. Um, and so this is the problem we face. Um, 
Now, at the moment, most plastic collection and projects in emerging nations are they're virtually uninvestable. Um, normal commercial finance that you would relatively easily access in developed nations would deem projects in emerging nations as, as high risk, maybe even ultra high risk due to the economic environment that they sit within, they're often early stage of operations and also combined with the very fragile economics of plastic recycling. And if funding ever does become available in emerging nations, it's at very high interest rates with sometimes impossible guarantees that must be given to the banks in order to, to release the funding. And so as a consequence, funding in, in these territories is, is often limited to grant-based funding. So organisations like the Alliance Against Plastic Waste or USAID, uh, who put you know, very significant money into these territories to initiate plastic collection and recycling capacity expansion um, is, is sort of the mainstay. But, but the problem here is that these projects, once they've used their grant funding in emerging nations, they, they face a, a cliff edge. Um, so when they need follow on funding, there's really nothing available. Um, and so many projects, they just simply simply fall off the cliff and they cease to exist. The projects don't go forward. Um, and so this is really the, the essence of the problem we're trying to solve. We are, we are trying to make, we're trying to find a finance pathway for projects which historically are unfinanceable. Uh, and so not an easy challenge. But, but there was there is one glimmer of hope, and this is really what Sonia and I worked on, and Sonia will talk to you more when she comes onto her side of things, is that projects, whilst they are extremely cash poor in emerging nations, they are extremely rich in environmental and social impact. Um, and so if we could find a way to create a tradable asset out of environmental and social impact, then we have a pathway, you know, to finance uh, plastic collection and recycling projects in emerging nations. And so that's essentially what we did with the Plastic Waste Re Reduction Bond. We, we, by using the Vera Plastic Waste Reduction Standard, we just reimagined how, um, how, um, the standards and its associated plastic credit program could be used to uh, verify environmental and social impact. And for that, that impact that is created, we, we create an asset class, a new asset class for mm -hmm. environmental impact. And, and so, so this is really, what, as I say, this is what we, we did. And, and so the, and, and what this really means is that the, the projects, instead of having an obligation to pay back cash for debt that they receive, instead they pay back environmental impact. And so every time the project um, removes plastic from nature and diverts it from landfill, uh, their debt reduces a little bit. Over a period of time, they will have remove sufficient plastic waste from nature um, and diverted it from landfill so that um, their debt becomes zero. And that's really that's really the core essence of it. I saw you probably tell you a bit more about the, the more technical side of it in a second. But um, and and really the, the the impact then is really quite phenomenal. Um, so, and I'll, I'll tell you, perhaps I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go further, but that's really the problem we're trying to solve. Yeah. Thank you so much for all that context. I think it just really shows, you know, just emphasizes the challenge and why you kind of have to <laughs> think of new ways of um, getting finance to these activities, which is where I, I'm so glad we have Sonia here too from Citibank to really explain the nitty gritty of how this bond works. I feel like people have seen a lot of numbers and the headlines, they get confused of how the where the money is going and, and how it all works. So I'm going to hand it over to you to just share a little bit more about the design and, um, and, 
anything else that, that might be interesting for our participants to hear. Thank you very much, Kristen. <clears throat> thanks, Steve, and uh, lovely uh, meeting everyone, and thank you for having me. So, um, can you hear me? Yeah, that's good. Um, so, basically, uh, one of the critical things that we tried to solve, as Steve mentioned, was how to channel capital market to this project. So, one of the tools enabled was obviously the plastic credit that, um, with Vera standard, has created, where you have a project um, that will either collect or recycling plastic, and then you have um, an attribute uh, that can be measurable issued and then sold on to potential buyer. So that was really one of the main issues that, that has been solved by, by, by the creation of this tender. Then the second uh, issue that we faced was how can we um, find a way to, to, to gap between, uh, basically between the timing mismatch, between when the costs are needed for the project to start because they, they have, a, I mean, they quite a lot of capex requirement, as Steve mentioned. This is a quite big project. It's not a small one usually. And the time um, um, a plastic credit is issued and sold in the market. So how do we, you know, solve for this timing mismatch? And that's where we worked to structure um, the plastic bond that was solving this uh, timing mismatch. So Essentially, the way the bond is working is, um, so if you take a normal uh, a bond, normally the investor will invest in the bond, they will receive a coupon yearly, and at the end they receive the capital back if it's a guarantee uh, bond, which is the case on this one, capital guarantee. This time, what we did is um, we actually, uh, so the World Bank issued a seven uh, year, 100 million, uh, principal protected uh, a bond, um, then so the, the 100 million will not leave the, the World Bank. They are used for the normal proceed, right? But the coupon that should have been paid to the investor in the normal situation bond are actually uh, paid upfront to City that we transfer immediately to Plastic Collective that can channel to the two projects. Um, uh, that we had for this bond to project um, as I say and, and circular so in Ghana and Indonesia. And after a while, once um, plastic credit are issued and carbon credit, I mean, once <laughs> the dual methodology will happen, then uh, the uh, investor will receive um, cash based on that. So the, the, this is what we call an outcome bond is that um, plastic credit, carbon credit are issued, yes, is they are paid? No, there is no. Now, what we did with this one, we actually split the investment in two in order to guarantee some coupon. So some of the coupon will uh, not be paid upfront to the project, but they will leave, we stayed within the World Bank and will be paid to uh, the investor and the rest will be at risk. So essentially, if the project doesn't issue um, plastic credit or carbon credit, then the investor will have the coupon guarantee, the part of the coupon that is guaranteed, the capital back, but they will have lost a part of the coupon. But if the project performs, they don't have any market risk, and uh, CT is taking the market risk for carbon credit and plastic collective for the plastic credit, and then uh, they receive the cash linked to that. And essentially, this was actually very an, a new way for actually uh, when you looked at uh, who are the investor, uh, they are global investor, um, and they've invested in, in that note. Uh, but in normal situations, they will never have been able to invest in this type of project without this vehicle. So this vehicle has been uh, enabling to channel some financing from the capital market that in, uh, in a normal situation will never have flow to uh, this project. Um, so essentially, yes, that was really to try to bridge that uh, timing mismatch between when the project needs a fund and when some revenue are generated by the issuance of the credit. Thank you so much for that overview. Um, and I think, yeah, people 
it just puts it all into perspective about how how that that money channels maybe just being conscious of time steve though it's always interested for interesting for people to hear about the the projects and kind of the on the ground impact so and you could share a little bit more about what the projects that you at plastic collective have helped develop will be able to do with this finance um, thanks to the bond, I think that would be really helpful. And also, if you have any other comments about, you know, the potential for this model to help scale other projects and, and investments in the future. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> the the key of a, a key aspect of the this bond financing mechanism is that it can be um, suitably generous to the project so that they are properly financed for the next 10 years. Um, and the finance has a number of different use, use of proceeds, essentially. Typically, the, the, the lion's share, perhaps half of it, may go towards CapEx, which is buying machinery, building facilities, provisioning training, educational programs, all this sort of stuff. So money that's got to be spent up front to, to turn a small project into a big project. And that scaling period and the CapEx expenditure period may be two or three years. Um, there is also uh, an amount of money that's allocated from the funding to OPEX. Um, Plastic collection and recycling projects are pretty vulnerable at small scale. So there's a certain scale they have to get to before they become stable or more stable. And so um, supporting the operation, ongoing operations of the project as they move from a small project to a big project is also critical. So there's got to be um, capital or funding there for unexpected um, events that might occur in the, in the interim. And then the third bit, which is very unique to plastic recycling, is um, a, a, a term that we've coined, which is called SOCX. So this is social capital. And um, the <clears throat> in the plastic space, as we all probably all know, um, in, in the emerging nations, the there are 20 million uh, plastic waste collectors around the world who do the job of removing plastic from nature, a very vital role. And... Um, the plastic problem can't be solved if the um, uh, the welfare and well-being of, of these waste pickers uh, is also not thought of. And so there's a significant amount of money in the in the funding um, to go towards the, you know, the the welfare and well-being of waste collectors, and that is delivered to them in a very structured program, um, which. Um, it requires the projects to certify and act in a certain way to ensure that the, pro the, the waste collectors get above average wages, uh, get health and medical insurance, um, have safe and healthy working conditions, get training and education programs, uh, amongst other things. So, so that's the key areas where the money, the money is used, um, and and so far, you know, we've we've had now nine months into the execution of this first bond uh, probably another six and a half years to go um we're making great progress and so the funding the funding structure is proving to be you know very successful wonderful um and for anyone that's interested these two projects that received the funding asase and sea circular um in ghana and indonesia respectively you can look on the vera registry today and learn more about them, their project documents and other information have all been posted there. Um, we're, we're kind of running out of time, but um, I want to thank you all both for sharing more about this bond. I know it's really extremely interesting to many, and I think it's exciting to see what more might come from um, similar applications in the future. So thank you both. And I will carry on to close this out. So we wanted to spend just a bit of time if we're going to the next slide. Just speaking to the market opportunities for plastic credits, you know, this is a common um, question. Rohan acknowledged there are still some uncertainties in demand. And so we want to speak to some of the potential use cases of plastic credits. Uh, we know that corporates, especially which are seen as probably the most likely buyer of these credits, there's mounting pressure for them to address plastic pollution. And there are 
voluntary commitments that they are making, like those from EMF's global commitments or regional PACs. They have recycled feedstock demands and targets that they have to meet and as such are thinking about how they can support the collection and recycling infrastructure that's needed to increase the supply of those materials for them to actually use and, and meet the content targets. And there's the age-old reputation and public perception concerns around plastic pollution. Consumers are in increasingly aware of the impact and are holding corporations accountable for it with their own purchasing power. And that's all irrespective of the, the increase in regulation that we're seeing, whether that's national extended producer responsibility schemes or the impending impact of the global plastic treaty once those negotiations are finalized. So corporates are looking for ways to finance collection and recycling. And plastic credits could be used in a variety of ways, whether that's to, you know, compensate their footprint. And by that, I mean, they're just purchasing an amount equal to their plastic footprint for either voluntary um, commitments or potentially compliance obligations in those regions where credits have been acknowledged as a, a means of complying with extended producer responsibility. Um, some may be just purchasing them as a form of contributing to waste management infrastructure and making those investments. So these could complement other targets around plastic or just be a demonstration of, of leadership beyond those regulatory requirements that they are under. And there's also some, you know, corporations that maybe plastic isn't a key part of their supply chain, but they are motivated to purchase these credits because they see the, you know, significant social and environmental impact that results from removing plastic waste from the environment or diverting it to recycling um, and in, in, in turn, um, improving some of those social outcomes. And on the, in the next slide, we just wanted to make a final allusion to some of the opportunities for plastic credits to support EPR. We know that there is a lot of interest and intrigue about how these could work together. Um, like Rohan said, I don't, plastic pollution or plastic credits is not a single solution. It, it, it It's one tool of many. And we know that extended producer responsibility is going to continue to remain at the top of the list of one of those solutions that might be able to address the plastic pollution problem. And we see plastic credits as being able to support in that implementation and execution of EPR by helping to mobilize additional financing required to overcome the infrastructure deficit that's needed to actually operational operationalize EPR. You know, in many countries, it's great to have EPR, but if you don't have the collection and recycling in place, then the fees that are collected, you know, are only going to show impact once that capital investment has been made. And we know that can take a long time. So in the interim, while extended producer responsibility is being developed, that's where credits can help channel finance to that infrastructure. And by doing so, accelerate the comprehensive waste collection and treatment of plastic um, and plastic credits, especially those you know issued by Vera, by realm of having a plastic program like ours, it provides the data, infrastructure, and measurement framework to operationalize EPR schemes, and could even potentially offer governments a pathway where plastic credits can be used to meet the compliance obligations that they put in place. Um, as part of their extended producer responsibility. We, because I have you here, I have to mention it. We um, released a discussion paper in August that touches on some of these topics and the opportunities for plastic credits, especially in the development of extended producer responsibility in emerging markets and developing economies. And we'll be working on a full white paper that will be released um, in the next month for those that are interested in supporting or you know exploring this topic further. So we encourage you to keep an eye out for that. Um, but with that, we're getting close to the top of the hour again. And Unfortunately, we don't have time for Q&A, but 
For any people that have questions that were answered, we sincerely encourage you to email um, plasticstandard at vera.org at the bottom there with your follow-up questions. We'd be happy to um, either answer them ourselves or potentially route them to the right person who can. Um, and we encourage you, if you are interested in learning more, visit our website, review some of the case studies that are there, and subscribe to our newsletter for ongoing developments around this, especially for financial institutions. Um, we are happy to provide you know, more formal capacity building and collaboration um, support as um, you know, banks and institutions are exploring different financial instruments. Um, whether that be through a MOU or or just, um, you know, setting up a meeting. So please do feel free to reach out. Um, with that, I want to thank all of our participants or speakers that were able to join us here today. Thank you so much for making time and thank you for everyone else that joined. Um, all participants will receive a recording of the webinar as well as a link to the slide deck and we hope to engage with you all further. Thank you and have a great day everyone.